thank you all for attending. Um, Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Plasma Call. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Carlo, yeah, yeah. Oh, Carlo Joseph, so, please start. Yeah, so maybe we start off with um, what, you know, what we're uh, introduction on uh, what we're researching. Um, what we're you know enthusiastic with plasma, and then maybe we can do another round on like. Um, actually, before that, we can maybe like give a. I think it would be fun actually to start off with maybe talking about what one thinks are good um, applications of plasma, and what it's good like what what it could be good for, what it could maybe not be good for, and what one is working on when it comes to um, specifically applications, and that way there's some context um, for that. So introduction and the interests for each one. Yeah. 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 Introduction and interests. There's a lot of stuff yeah. mentioned there. Um, okay, well, well I'll, I'll just first say what I, I think are good applications of Plasma, because I think that's sort of the interesting thing here. Um, obviously, payments and exchange are like the Plasma application, at least right now. It's sort of the, the thing that's most you know, useful or, or novel, um, but, and, and kind of, makes use of this blockchain as, as a value store slash exchange thing. But uh, other stuff that I'm really excited about is gaming in general. Um, it's, it's one of these things that brings people in and it's simple, it's not threatening. Uh, you know, I'm willing to put $10 into a video game and I don't really care if I never play that video game again. And, and you know, I, that $10 is just gone, that's, that's fine. And so the same doesn't apply if we're talking about payments, like I expect that my bank app doesn't lose my money, um, but I have different expectations on, on games. And so uh, I, think, I think games are actually quite feasible today with Plasma, as, as Loom has just made very clear. And I think that people should start looking at that right now. I'm, I'm highly interested in getting a sort of Plasma, uh, kind of like an SDK set up so that people can just build these games um, without really understanding what the underlying Plasma chain does. Plaps. Uh, Plaps. 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 No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> Do you guys want to go? Uh, just get out sure. Uh, I'm David. I feel like uh, with Plasma in its current state, it's excellent uh, for supporting applications that don't require an incredible amount of interaction uh, with like the rest uh, of the like uh, the root chain ecosystem. Uh, just because uh, the way things are right now with the root chain having custody, uh, it's super great for like, modular uh, modular systems. Uh, and then uh, also, I would say I'm very excited about the potential for plasma chains uh, to kind of uh, work uh, like down the road. Uh, they can be more private uh, than public chains, uh, and so excited to see that explored more, especially with the plasma cache architecture, uh, where users don't actually have to know uh, about uh, the entire uh, information on ch on chain. The only thing that uh, I believe what makes me interested in Plasma as a technique is the fact that you can settle many transactions, whatever they may be, whatever information it is, without bloating the chain. So, you know, like in the, in the casual, let's say, uh, Bitcoin logic that you don't want to put any data more than what's necessary. And I believe that's a general problem with dApps, that the um, smart contracts, they store too much whatever on chain. So, yeah, let's put just 32 bytes per whatever amount of time, and it's better. And yeah, payments. Okay. Uh, well, it's difficult to add to everything was said before. Uh, I think you should add two parts. First is the ZK-based plasmas or other constructions like the Vitalik proposed with posting all the data on chain. Oh, okay. Uh, the ZK based plasmas as a plasmas where the state transition is governed by snark or stark or maybe other features ZK, uh, ZK construction. In principle, it is mainly an ultimate goal. You can make an invalid state transition, but you still have the data availability. Uh, an intermediate solution was introduced by Vitalik in a recent post, uh, I think two weeks ago in his research, where it says, well, post, post all the data on chain and make it as a public input to your snark and 
very good. Well, you bloat the transaction data, you pay an extra gas cost, but still you can aggregate a lot. This is a great approach, and I think the ultimate plasma will still be somehow based on ZKPs. Uh, another part that people forget, and we had this discussion a little before, uh, original plasma paper had a part about the MapReduce functionality. There are very limited sets of computation which are still viable this way. For example, what you can do right now is you can offload, for example, the snark verification of chain. For example, there is some game which is governed by a state, which the state is governed by a snark. And in principle, the only part you actually care is that the state transition is valid, and you can offload the snark verification of chain to some operator, which you can easily monitor because snark, verifi snark verification is two milliseconds. So is a verification and it's stateless. So this approach may work but we should maybe focus more on it after we solve the payments and exit problem. Um, yeah, just to add to that, I guess a lot of people ask me what's the difference between Plasma and sidechains, and that also plays into the, the use cases. So um, in general, the side, on the, if you have transactions on a sidechain, you basically just need to calculate the amount that you need to bribe the validator, so proof of work operators with, and you know how secure your transaction is. Um, the main difference, I think, to Plasma is that on Plasma, you don't do that calculation. The answer is you need to bribe the Ethereum uh, proof of work. Um, so we kind of extend the security of the Plasma, uh, of the mainnet onto the Plasma chain. That is not done with side chains. And I think that works specifically for exchanges and all apps that have high deposits. So at the moment, we're an exchange deposit size exceeds the um, uh, stake size of the validators, it rationally makes sense uh, to steal. And that is not true for plasma chains. So that's where these use cases could live. I'm super excited about Plasma because of the, at least for now, the you know scalable payments and exchange type stuff. Because we are close, and I think it's really important for just crypto as a whole to like one, generate a lot more assets, and two, make sure that those assets are very easy to exchange. And I think that that will like facilitate the generation of value in our kind of like weird economy. And so yeah, I'm hopefully Plasma can can play a part in that story. So uh, I believe we should take a more yeah, structured yeah. format because we're just like talking about the vision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's I, set some like questions like between us to discuss yeah. and maybe. We'll get yeah, some but feedback. let's let's make sure everyone has uh, what they want to say. Yeah, there was an agenda document. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was a very important point. yeah. Um, yeah, I think it'd be it'd be good to definitely get into that because we have a limited time. Um, Can I say the question? As, as long as everyone like went through the introductions that they wanted to make. You want to speak? Oh, no? Okay. okay. Um, for me, like I'm, right now, my principal area is that um, you know beyond what everyone said, which I do agree with, um, like 100%. I think payments are important, and like definitely a lot of um, advantages over you know at least the federated sidechain models. Um, another major thing that I think could be really, very helpful for um, at least this ecosystem is that you know you're seeing a lot of you know Ethereum me too's and a lot of people that want to copy Ethereum. And what's interesting is that is that Ethereum can end up being you know a central point between a lot of different you know blockchains. Even even if you know let's say you want to build a DApp ecosystem inside Ethereum, I think you know obviously that is that is much more advantageous because you do have you know people that you know the, the the stack is there, the community is there, developers are there. But even with you know Ethereum me twos, they're probably going to have to cross through Ethereum. And um, Ethereum can end up being like a central trading point for that as well. All right, I have a question. <laughs> so, um, with respect to sharding, it is considered a layer one solution, like maybe mechanism, because the actual the whole connection between the Bitcoin chain and the shard chain it is built built in the protocol, and, and there are no gas costs for doing that. So I was. I kind of playing around with the idea of like forking Go Ethereum or Parity and uh, make it so that there is um, basically all plasma operations free, okay? But in a way that it's not dosable in the same way that how like the um, proof of stake uh, Asper design would work. And so would that make plasma layer one? Discuss. Does it make sense? Well, first of all, all of us are implementers of different kind of flavors of Plasma, and I will not name any of those. We have the bonds on exits. First, you should define what is a Plasma operation which should be made free. And in principle, what you're proposing is more like a Polkadot, 
uh, if there are some special smart contracts which are free, I think it breaks the philosophy of the ecosystem. I mean, you can make the block spam as an operator, as a central party. Um, what, maybe you can make some other fancy stuff which you can like, make out right now, but uh, let's start with without this proposal at least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, yeah, it's kind of like the whole like shelling fence type thing where once you start uh, making in protocol changes or like layer one protocol changes, uh, where do you draw the line? I'd be really interested in seeing more like discussion about uh, essentially coupling or like combining uh, root chain block submission between plasma chains because uh, that's a way to essentially reduce the cost of running plasma chains uh, without making base layer protocol changes. Um. <coughs> So I think uh, some of my concerns about like enshrining anything plasma related in layer one is that like um, it adds a new like liveness assumption to to Ethereum validators or people who hold um, value on Ethereum. Like you have to um, like the protocol says you have to log in once every um, certain amount of time, and like that's not that's not a trade off everyone wants to make. Like um, some people are even unhappy about the that like proof of stake adds a weak subjectivity kind of. Yeah, yeah, basically that. Yeah, I definitely agree with Shanji right there. Um, I, I think when it comes to changes on layer one, um, I mean, this is a little bit tangential, but gets to the point as well. I think when it comes to layer one and how, how it can help Plasma, um, I think you know there, there's there's a dynamic where you know we're dealing with different layers there, and communications between them is pretty important. So um, you know that that may require coordinating coordinating with you know a lot of the core Ethereum research. Um, one topic that I do care about, and I actually don't know if it's on the roadmap, so maybe um, tell me if this is or isn't, um, Carl, is some type of calculation for um, basically the gas costs uh, per block, and I think some type of metric for that. Um, can be really helpful on the plasma side because it makes the um, you know um, more robust exiting games and reliability on that could be pretty helpful, but um, is not necessary for plasma. But you know you may you may see these dynamics where like you know whether it be contracts or layer two type things you know can be helpful for layer one in, in the opposite perspective. Yeah, that's actually. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Uh, I mean, the, the whole gas uh, market is actually going to get revamped with the, the Ethereum 2.0, and you can kind of like read about that in Vitalik's, uh, like he has a paper out there. Um, and so, yeah, I think it should be more viable. There, it, it, yeah, it's definitely it more stack, consistent, right? right? Just push it to stack, like some, yeah. some opcode where it like pushes, let's say, not even like all the blocks, like not storing all the blocks, uh, like gas costs, but maybe like yeah. maybe the previous ones or the current one. Why not? You know? like, that why seems not? very reasonable. Yeah, yeah we the, should do that. What is the change? Um, basically, you push onto stack, maybe some opcode where you push onto the stack the, um, the uh, maybe you have some variable, assign a variable, um, basically some, um, what the gas costs on that block was. Oh, like uh, to, to see, to, to read what the gas price is. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. For context yeah. in the audience, um, right now, doing gas cost estimation in contracts on recent blocks is uh, difficult. Um, we have something like that where we assume that if there is more than one operator, they compete for the next block. Just think along this way. And then, you know, when, when the, um, the header is submitted, we can just do message gas. And then we save that and take the average over the last X blocks. Yeah, um, specifically an example where um, it, that, that definitely is a good idea. Um, but for exits, um, this, this, this can be beneficial as well because that way you can, you can uh, have maybe relative bond sizes um, relative to the cost of exiting. When, when, you, when you exit, right, you want to be able to pay for whoever is going to challenge you. You want to be able to pay for their gas cost. And so doing that is a little bit tricky, and you probably have to overestimate, and it would be helpful to have this kind of in protocol. Be nice. One, huh. one thing I, um, um, one comment I have to make about that is like the current gas, um, the current gas market is not designed to be like resistant to manipulation if people are relying on, on if people are relying on it for, um, um, to, to have an accurate metric of, to have an accurate metric of this is how much you you have to pay in order to guarantee inclusion in the block. 
it's very hard to predict gas prices in the future, as one might imagine, because we don't necessarily know. Like there was, some, we, we've thought a lot about like let's make it so that you can send a transaction that's guaranteed to be included in a block in the future. But that gets so funky because then you're like, okay, what are the actual gas prices? Like there are weird manipulations that you can do. If you thought gas token was weird, this just gets very confusing. So I was about to say that that in my opinion, I, I'm considering implementing uh, basically gas token. So the gas token construction, is, it exploits a market inefficiency where you can just buy gas at a very low, low price and you can reuse it at some later point. And so uh, I was uh, thinking that maybe like, uh, you can have like, a miner inside the plasma contract which just like, makes useless operations during the night or wherever like, the, the, the gas price is low. And so like, if currently, if I buy gas at like, 2 gigaway, like and I submit one block per like, uh, 15 seconds, Maybe it costs 100,000 per year, which sucks. But if you bought at 0.1 UA, which is totally feasible like with this inefficiency, um, basically the cash cost is totally manageable. However, uh, you're exploiting an inefficiency, and the moment that people, other people also start using it, then this inefficiency goes away. So it is, not, it is totally a hack that is temporarily, that's only a temporary solution. And, and to be clear, these are all optimizations. Um, yeah, yeah, it still yeah. works without this stuff. Yeah, but still opti any optimization or just anything which reduces the inefficiency of any market, and Ethereum is largely so, a huge market, is still great because regardless. people do the same in other areas, and you need to do this. And could be helpful for many other smart contracts is basically this, this dynamic. Regarding the fee market, uh, the ga so actually there is the market for gas, that for the bonds, that you put up also, like when you're making an exit. So I would like to initiate a discussion on the incentives of miners front running challenge transactions. And like how would you approach it? My current understanding is that you can do it with a commitment, but still that commitment also leaks information. Uh, there is a current effort on submarine sense that essentially you, you make a commitment that is more stealthy. Um, yeah, I would be interested if you have an opinion on that. Um, specifically, um, the commitments for uh, how into to, a plasma block or how from to a plasma block how to, to avoid change. the question is how to avoid challenge front running. Um, challenge front running with regards to um, exiting on the main chain or from always to the main chain. Yeah. Okay. Oh, the main. no, I, I, make, exit I, make, from the main. I make an exit and somebody must challenge me. I put a 0 0.1 ether bond. Somebody goes to challenge me, they put up, they go, they make the transaction, the miner sees it, they make the transaction before the challenger. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that, that means that they sweep the, they get the bond, right? The miner gets right, the bond. Right, right, right. This is an implicit, like, this is a, a fee on top of, this mm -hmm. essentially creates a secondary market which it complicates how like the miners can calculate their profits mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. due to how like you're no longer based on this like gas model and essentially it's based like it adds incentive to sensor transactions so you lose fees that are on layer one but you gain on fees that are on layer two mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how would you model this approach because essentially you, yeah. basically um what you mean i think correct me if i'm wrong so i can describe it to the audience is um this dynamic whereby um, a proof of invali invalidity or some type of proof basically doesn't have a signature attached to it necessarily, no. whereby that's uh, not I'm what not you're talking saying. about that. I'm talking about the simple fact that the miner can simply, or another user can monitor the chain similar to the, mar to the bank or inefficiency if anybody else is familiar with that, <laughs> that essentially you front run a transaction and if I, if you I notice- You can let the penalty. No, 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 no. So I make an exit on chain. Yep, yep. Okay, I make, I put up a bond. Mm -hmm. It is an invalid exit. Mm -hmm. We don't care about that. We care about the, the economics regarding the challengers. And then the miner basically publishes the exit. Whoever, no, 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 the, the exit has happened. It's okay, the exit okay. has been okay, initiated. Perfect. Okay, And now somebody wants to challenge the exit. Mm -hmm. They challenge, the, the challenge is a valid challenge. Yep. Okay, but somebody else comes and front runs yeah, the yeah. challenge. Mm -hmm. This means that if there is a way for people to front run your transactions, yep. Yep you no longer are guaranteed to profit mm -hmm. from the transactions. Yes. And the rational um, decision mm -hmm. is to stop challenging, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm I claiming that- the same thing. Oh, basically, the claim basically is that when you broadcast it, the person that's going to front run most likely is the miner. Oh yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Po point being that front running, it directly impacts the security of the chain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very likely does. Because um, people will stop challenging if mm -hmm. they get front run by the miners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the miners are in the perfect position where they control both the layer two simply by 
playing this game where they simply bully the people out of challenging. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a risk with a lot of these things. There's multiple, there's multiple mitigations. You can do basically, I don't like this, but you know, a naive solution would be to you know, do some commit reveal whereby basically you, still you commit to a hash, yeah, yeah. similar to a Foxcoin construction, you know, Jobano in 2014 wrote, you know, uh, Foxcoin, you do something like that where you commit to the hash of whatever it is that you're going to do. Uh, Namecoin does something similar. Um, the, there are significant issues with this to be able, in, in terms of complexity with the smart contract code. Um, I think some type of model where you're splitting up the penalty or maybe pre-committing where penalties go to um, is probably shorter in terms of lines of code. So for example, you can assign, let's say 50% of the penalty as part of this specific output goes to these sets of people. And those are the sets of people responsible for publishing. But then you, made, you just made the challenge mechanism not trustless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that we that is a possibility that, if you already have someone watching on your behalf, I mean. Okay, but trustless watchtowers aren't real, are they? Um, what do you, it depends what you mean by trustless watchtowers, but basically, um, yeah, I mean, basically you would have to do some type of commit reveal then as a consequence. And that does extend out the challenge period. It probably increases the exit code by like, you know, at least 10 to well, 15 lines of code. The Kelvin had an idea, had a point in agenda about the submarine commitments. Uh, Kelvin, can you explain it in short? I read the documents and well, more or less it just get, and I, I have one question which will need to be answered later. Sure, so the, the problem with just, just standard commit reveal is that um, usually, well, the, the fact that I'm committing is leaking information about the fact that I am going to make an action. I'm not telling you what the action is, well, but- You have to commit to what it is you're going to commit to, though. It doesn't matter. Can Still, you, you can front run the commitment, you can recommit. Right, so-, so Or so if you no, I, cannot be allowed to recommit. I don't think that's the, that's so we might be talking about different things, but I think the strongest attack is is not to front run the commitment. It's to notice that a commitment has happened and then and then go and check all the exits. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the point, right? So that I, if I'm a miner, um, the original problem is that if if I see a challenge, I can just execute the challenge and boom, I'll, I'll see that it's a valid challenge. So I'll front run it and I'll take the fee instead of the person who actually did the work to spot the error and and throw the challenge. So the the first solution that you could do is is make a commitment. So somebody is is asked to commit to making a challenge before actually revealing the challenge information. Um, the problem with this is that it leaks the information that somebody is going to challenge later. And so what they do yeah, is... It does. What? Yeah, yeah, it does. It doesn't leak that somebody will challenge. It leaks that somebody... It doesn't leak that somebody will challenge. It leaks that somebody made an action. Well, well, it, correct. It, it leaks it, it the leaks intent. At least that somebody somebody made an action, and and because somebody is forced to make an action uh, before challenging later, right? We've we've asked people to commit then reveal. Um, a, a miner can say, okay, I saw a commitment, so now I'm going to check it, and then I'm going to front run, and I'm going to I'm going to get my commitment in first. And so so the problem with this is that it's the same exact same exact issue that a miner they don't have to do any work until somebody else does the work, then they can do it. They can spot the problem, front run it, and take the fee, and which kind of destroys the whole thing. So, so generally, the, the idea of these submarine commitments is that you make a commitment in a way that um, you, you're not leaking the information that you have made a commitment, right? So, so you basically send a transaction to some random address, and then you later prove that you made a transaction to that random address, and nobody can tell that you made a commitment in advance. And, and so the benefit of this is that you're not leaking the inv information that you, you, may, you might be planning to act later on, and so you, you don't have this front-running problem. But it is significantly more complex than, than not having this, right? I think from my perspective is, I think, you know, given, given your worst case characters, I actually don't think it's that bad. You know, like if it ends up being the miner just ends up collecting the fees, that amounts to being burning the coins, right? From, a, from an individual's perspective. And I think that's acceptable because... Why, because why does the, the, there is no equilibrium in that situation because you, challenges will stop even though they are invalid. Oh, access. I think there's sufficient incentive to do challenges anyway. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not totally concerned with that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the cool thing about like Plasma Cash and Plasma Firm, these kinds of uh, Merkle tree where you own a particular subtree, um, 
the cool thing is that you have a very strong incentive to challenge no matter what, even if you're not gonna, even if you're gonna not make any money from this, like your coins are at risk. Ba basically, I think it, it, what we're talking about is what, what I think the implication, if we wanted to hone down on, on, on your concern, Georges, is that um, if you can get what you want in terms of your goals, um, bond sizes dr decrease dramatically. I think that's the end result because I think effectively, if you're talking about your worst case, it's possible that the bond size will get fairly large and maybe maybe you know large enough that you have to be fairly capitalized in order to do it. And definitely, it's a it's it's a research opportunity that I think will make a pretty big difference in terms of the end usability, mm -hmm. um, in terms of whether one outsources one's exits in terms of the in sort of you know like trading the coins, uh, trading the the the, the actual mm -hmm. value. Um, so I think it is a really, really important thing to do. But given the worst case, I think you know effectively the bond size is if you increase it enough, then um, the probability of you personally watching it should be sufficient. So then the problem reduces to parameterizing probably. And so I'm curious on the how would you probably parameterize both the bonds and the duration of a dispute period? That's a really good question. I totally agree. Um, and I would be interested in a good like market analysis of how that would be. Yeah, so, so the other thing is that there was sort of the scorched earth version of this, which was if you can prove that an invalid exit went through, you burn the entire contract down. And so it creates like a <laughs> massive negative incentive for you to, to not challenge, right? And so we have this problem in, in Plasma MVP where um, so this wouldn't happen in Plasma Cache. You don't need this in Plasma Cache. But in Plasma MVP, you have this problem where, you know, if, if I make an invalid exit for, for $5 or whatever, you know, 0 0.0 whatever ETH, um, then if, if it goes through, the people who, who take the loss are the people at the end of the priority queue. It's the people, it's, it's not necessarily me, right? So it could be, you know, it's just some random person. And so you, that, that person would, they're the only person who's going to experience the, the negative impact of this. And so we can make other people experience the negative impact of this if we basically say we will burn down the entire contract, throw away all the money if you ever let this happen, which is like, you know, probably not a great solution, but I thought it was fun and it's a good thought I think, experiment. I think it's great. I think that there's like a general rule here where when you're designing these like economic crypto economic mechanisms, you don't, socialized losses are generally scary because it's this kind of common goods problem, right? With this prisoner's dilemma, we, you know, it's not really gonna affect me, I'm gonna exit before them, so why do I even care about this $5 that's going to be stolen? I can exist on a fractional reserve as long as I get out first, right? That's, those kinds of weird incentives where you, you share the burden of, you know, uh, uh, you know, challenging or whatever it is, pretty bad. The better incentives are when you are directly affected and only you are directly affected. And so you have a, the, the person who is supposed to act in response to this is like very, very clear. And I yeah. think bond sizing is, is, uh, is a really important topic that I think even, even us are not necessarily experts in. I think it's something where you know it applies to a lot of smart contracts in this space. You know, state channels are another example of this, where you know bond sizing um, in relation to gas fees are, are an important topic, um, and you know it affects a whole host of contracts. So if you're interested in or have an economics background or interested in this topic, it's something which you know everybody in the space would be very appreciative if you know you're interested in doing research in this. Yeah, uh, the Calvin, the question I had is: there is still indirect leaking of information in a submarine case because it's unfortunately due to the technical perspective how it's implemented. You do the transaction to some external smart contract address of which you know because you know some data which you need to publish so it will be genuine. This address for the contract will be recalculated. It gets to the problem if your transaction to this contract is somewhere some fancy amount, I, very small for example, it's leaking information. If it's an average, uh, it Basically, just well, rec if it's if it's more or less like an ordinary transaction, especially in a high season period when the transaction amount, for example, are high, it most likely means you need to have the higher amount to even start the challenge, and it becomes like another problem. The challenger should have, at the worst case, more than it would be just necessary to just maybe allow to front run you, and, and it's just indirect, kind of indirect loss. And as a side comment, I think you know the the reason why you know we do need a lot of people 
researching plasma and why you know a lot of people are, are making significant contributions is you need a lot of eyes on this. Um, for example, one thing like I just realized is just now sitting here is you know attack vector because like when you're talking about game theory, you need you need a lot of eyes on this to understand the game theory. An attack vector on the submarine is um, construction that I was just thinking of and correct me if I'm wrong. This this is viable is you know I always if I'm an attacker I'm always going to publish a submarine um, proof. Yeah, it would like you you would try you, you attempt to steal the submarine proofs. It, uh, you attempt to steal the penalty by always publishing a submarine proof. I don't reveal it, but when someone else reveals it, I also reveal my submarine proof. The, the submarine proof has to commit to the challenge. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm committing to my own my own my own invalid exit. But, but then I'm. The proof. But yeah, I mean, you start an invalid exit and yourself prevent it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so basically, like, I, I publish an invalid exit. I also publish a hash of the proof of the dispute. Okay. That's useful because when someone else publishes a penalty, I can claim that I did it before them. Oh, the so submarine proof is, <laughs> is, is very well linked to you, I think. Yeah. So, so, so what I'm saying is that, like, anyone in the audience can come up with interesting constructions and disputes on whatever mechanism that we're all coming up with. And it, it's something that's very, very important to do. And I'm not sure that this actually works, but you know, it's an example of you know, something which, you know, um, why, why the community when it comes to smart contract development is really, really important to you know, get everyone involved and have a lot of eyes look at this. Yeah. Oh yeah, Q&A would be fun. Q&A. Sorry guys, scalability of Ethereum with 1000 TPS, how would it affect Plasma negatively, positively? If layer one scales, will it make layer two obsolete, is the question. Not necessarily, it's really deeper, a bit deeper. So my understanding is that any time that you can commit less data to the chain, you do it. If you can do it, that's like pretty obvious. So there is always the need for layer two. Yeah. Like, I think that there are going to be different properties of the main chain and of plasma chains. Plasma chains are just going to have like, you know, maybe it's tons of scalability and you know exchange kind of built in and maybe fast uh, finality or something like this. Um, and something that I was thinking about is like, okay, does does plasma work in a sharded context? And I was like, oh, well, there's actually a really simple uh, construction which allows you to say, okay, I'm going to take one plasma chain and I'm going to hook it up to ten char shard chains, and then all ten shard chains will be able to deposit trans uh, deposit assets into the single massive plasma chain. And so then everyone's able to do kind of like native atomic swaps uh, across these different shards. I and so like, like how does it work? It's very simple. It's it very simple. Like I promise. Like, it, it's, it sounds like the, the vision, the dream, but I'm not sure how realistic it is. Oh, so I would love to. One contract in each shard. Yep. Representing uh, let, me, let me be more one precise. One plasma chain watches multiple shards. The, Boom. The timeline for this, it sounds unrealistic oh, yeah. to me. Well, it might take I mean, well, first we need Ethereum 2.0. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so we need, yeah, like, you uh, know. I, I, Honestly, I prefer like to be more like yeah. you know, practical. Well, the thing is, it's scary to research something and then be like, "Oh, this new technology is coming out. Does that just totally obsolete all of what I'm doing?" Jeff, I'm so curious. Uh, it doesn't matter so much about access to plasma from shards because, for at least for fungible token flows, because you can just instant swap. Uh, in channels between um, a channel literally anywhere in the ecosystem and a channel on Plasma anyways. So the only thing you need the connection between Plasma and the main chain for in terms of fungible tokens is managing net capital flows and arbitrage, which should happen like just every once in a while. It doesn't even matter, like people people don't even care. Yeah, so an example of something similar was that you can hook the Plasma more to the Morrison that just is really in flavor. And with, well, with some problems which arise because you can commit different blocks, uh, different headers and everything and it should be in time and available. But this is quite similar, so we can try this first if we, and then we'll see how it goes. Maybe some fancy market between the chains, we will see. Maybe between this uh, XDAI chain with this authority but stable coin inside of it, swap it to Ethereum inside the plasma, let's make other fancy ideas.
I was under the assumption that the XDAI chain is a trusted environment. Um, but um, to, to also extend your point from a different facet, um, you know, state channels um, are also relevant in relation to Plasma um, and will continue to be if you want things like instant finality and can be probably likely be the you know, front end interface, at least for most people. So I also have a completely unrelated question, which is why are you guys spending time on all this RSA accumulator stuff when you should just verify your state transitions? I yeah, totally I agree with Jeff. I actually would agree with that. <laughs> Directly conflicting with Carl's. Yeah, but there's different perspectives on this. So maybe we should I, I'm explain. I'm aware that I'm being contentious. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, well I, I got a slight disagree with that. <laughs> like, verifying, the state tra uh, verifying state transitions has like a, like, it, it might get a low marginal cost eventually, but you, you, you always pay the base cost. But with something like Plasma Cash, you can get down to like um, one S store per, like, which is like, uh, 20,000 gas per, per per transaction without without any like kind of batching thing. One, one S store for 10,000 transactions. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, that's what I mean. Yeah, so that's one advantage that you can get with. Um, yeah, the problem with this ZK based constructions you should encounter for more than just cost of posting the snark, but well, it state transition or something like this, any other construction. It also boils down if you want like one prover which should make your blocks, you should have the mechanism, in the case you don't publish the call data to the contract, you publish the block separately. You should have the mechanism to solve data availability. If you have competing operators, your cost increases because to calculate the snarks is not easy, it's not cheap. And now you have to multiply by the number of competing operators who should get, well, for those they should be reasonable to get the profits from it. So basically the transaction cost increases. Uh, this is also an area of research. Uh, the also other area of research we didn't talk today, we had uh, some discussion occurred there, is how you can make the stateless block validation, which was a recent paper published, I think, uh, thank you for George, just for link, uh, as research adverts, yeah. Uh, you can make a block validator completely stateless, you can write it on mobile device, you can have like almost absolute liveness. Hundred mi uh, hundreds of thousands of users. No. Uh, not the balanced one. For now, we take some model vector commits and we can dis discuss later why they're not usable right now. Uh, so he, there are various areas of research. This stateless validation is great just because we want liveness. We want someone watching, at least someone, the same way as uh, for Ethereum to bone down, you want someone to run this fancy hardware with VDF, you want someone to monitor the plasma, just someone. And then it will work. Otherwise, well, we need to work in user experience validation and everything, so yeah. The more people can change the research is better. It's, well, research may be difficult, implementation is still great because you need to test so many things. How does it work? How do you make the user experience? So just please join even if you don't want to research. You want just to write the code. <laughs> yeah, I think we, you know, we all, always, you know, the space always needs better systems engineers and more systems engineers. Um, I think, um, yeah, in, in addition to your question, I think, um, you know, having, Having a baseline using minimal fancy cryptography is good, and then having fancy cryptography used to make everything better, easier, faster, I think is a good rule of thumb in this space, and you know that, that makes a very strong measurable improvement yeah. of how things can work. Maybe a personal story. So I got into this Plasma research as well, and I was kind of like going strong on Ethereum-style contracts, and I thought there's nothing wrong with them. And then Kelvin wrote a bunch of interesting blog articles talking about how actually um, a ledger, you know, uh, tracks assets. It doesn't necessarily contracts should maybe not be first class citizens on um, on assets on on ledgers. And the whole plasma research has kind of led me to kind of rethink um, the architecture of Ethereum and kind of find that there could be a way more efficient setup where. In Bitcoin, you kind of have fat blocks, but a thin state. In Ethereum, you have thin blocks, a fat state. But we could go with thin blocks and thin state. Uh, it's always a trade of the Kelvin was talking about. It should be formalized. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I, I think it was loud enough. But still, this is a trade of what Kelvin, Kelvin was talking about. Until it formalized, well, uh, light client and light blocks, like ideal scenario. But still, <laughs> most likely there, there are trade-offs. Maybe there is nothing like uh, external computation powers that should be made to make some blocks. And one fun Ethereum 2.0 note is that the first focus and the main focus is providing a 
massive stream of available ordered data that you can rely on and trust, right? This is, in fact, the most primitive, in my opinion, because it is literally just information that we have consensus on. And information can be interpreted in whatever way you want. So if you want a different kind of Ethereum, you know, uh, EVM, or if you want to, you know, put Bitcoin or Zcash directly on Ethereum and use that kind of data stream, that's super cool, and in fact, it needs to happen. Please do, and we're gonna see all of these alternative execution engine uh, constructions probably pop up very soon. But we're like getting Ethereum down to its essence, which is very exciting. So you're basically saying when the base layer becomes cheap enough, we can use Plasma to absorb other chains. No, you could just make fancy <laughs> constructions with Plasma VM. Yeah, something like this. Just it needs a data stream and publish everything on the chain. No data availability problem whatsoever. <laughs> actually, actually, if I can, if I can come in, like I'm really excited about the the data availability thing. But like um, from a taxonomy point of view, like like uh, they've been called data um, layer two execution engines before, and it's basically like a mechanism which relies on uh, the root chain for um, for for data availability. Um, um, yeah, so like um, we could call it plasma if we want, but like it's it is it is useful to I think keep a distinction between things like plasma cache, which which don't rely which don't rely on that, um, and and things which do. Yeah. Yeah. Roll yeah, rollup would be uh, an example of something that relies on um, uh, the uh, Ethereum for data availability. All right, so I want to start an argument here. Which oh is no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Miguel, what up? <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so my question is, uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier about the original Plasma paper um, and how you use the MapReduce um, mechanism and how that doesn't necessarily fit into most use case. I'm kind of curious, like, what kind of use case would it fit into? Uh, is it still, like, necessary, like, for example, we deal with time series data? Would that, you know, is that kind of that a use case? Um, and then secondary question, um, the original paper has, like, multiple layers. And is that layering just for the mass exit mechanism? Is that is that layering even necessary anymore? Uh, so that's, that's basically right now, we're not even at that stage. The presumption is, is I think, what we're realizing is the scalability benefits um, that you can get simply by having one plasma chain is probably gonna be sufficient for the overwhelming use cases. Um, the, the, the notion of nesting gives you the benefit of, you know, scalability within the context of, you know, perhaps, you know, you don't want to, it, it, engineering wise, it's a lot easier to have computation that can fit on one server, right? That's that's simply like if you ask any distributed systems engineer, like once you have you know some state across multiple servers, the engineering challenge just blows up, and that's fine to do if you have no other choice. Um, and it's sort of a model of how you can do that um, for a lot of state across different you know uh, 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 that that goes beyond that. Um, right now, the problem sets that we're dealing with probably can be done on one you know, high-powered server or a set of high-powered servers. Um, or, or so specifically one set of high-powered servers and you can eventually go into a set of high-powered servers by making nested commitments. We're not writing any of the code for that right now simply because, or doing any designs for that right now simply because it's not, we're not even seeing a need for that necessarily. Um, the, the context for the MapReduce construction within, within that need is um, within that within that within that process is that um, essentially um, there's a problem in relation to a lot of UTXO like constructions, whereby UTXO like constructions don't do global state that well. It's sort of like um, in terms of data structures, if you can only do linked lists and you can't do maps or arrays, right? Like it's sort of like, well, what can you really do with this, right? When you're dealing with global state, essentially you need to some type of you know global agreement or consensus. So it's a statement that you basically have the plasma chain be processing global consensus, and that's basically what what we're doing right now. Yeah, regarding the map producers, I, well, maybe I shouldn't mention this construction how we can offload the snark execution of chain. But in principle, as Kelvin mentioned, there should be either clear ownership of state, which you can exit, and in most of our cases, for now, the state is a value. If you don't, if your state is something abstract, which you can live with having exiting like the previous state at some point, and just saying, well, this is a previous one, which is the last valid, and I can just offload all the computation, and I'm fine with exiting like the previous like the last valid state on chain and doing something with it in the worst case scenario, then you can put the computation inside. So you can make it like offloading computation of chains the same way as everyone wants to do with the snarks 
verify it on chain, with the Starks verify it on chain, you can do something similar. It's the idea is not huge, and you can just try to make it. But very limited set of computations which you can uh, use, and like maybe games can be done this way. Well, games can be done on Snarks at least. <laughs> Sorry. Cool. All right, five second argument. Plasma naming scheme is bad, and you should feel bad. Oh, yeah. um, okay. So, so my, you know, we we had this kind of meme naming scheme, right, where we we went off. Bitcoin forks, so we had Plasma Cash, Plasma XT, what else did we have? Plasma Gold, Plasma NG, whatever, right? So, um, and, and it's totally involved into this problem where in order to be, I mean, the idea is like to capture this design that you've created with one name and refer to the design with that name. Um, and, and so now it's been this thing where like incremental benefits, like tiny little improvements are allocated their own entire name, which makes you know, kind of no sense. And, and and then also like people have been taking this as I in order for my design to be taken seriously, I need to assign it a name. And so you have this massive bloat of the of the plasma namespace and, and it's super confusing. I think it's just like it, it makes it really hard for me to refer to what I'm actually talking about when there's like 18 different names. So I think it's considered harmful. Um, I, I mean, I, I like the idea of naming things. I think that we should just be careful about, you know, unless it's something totally novel. Like I like Plasma Prime being named its own thing because it's just, it's a ton of work that's been done over the last few months put into its thing and it really refers to a, a large improvement over Plasma Cache, but like micro improvements, right? Just designs that aren't well fleshed out. Um, I, I feel like we should present the ideas and then it's only when it's really solidified into a, a package should it be assigned a name. And, and I would, my, my vote here is that we take that naming scheme to heart, but I am open to arguments against this. Um, I think we're short on time. Let, let me bring okay. the mic to this okay. guy. And while I bring the mic, oh, he got. I just want to ask, uh, in your opinion, for example, what's what's the best challenge time for the for the challenge period? Well, that's the question. Is we actually don't know, and that's why you know um, you know like I think we can uh, take a lot of the work used for state channels as of late. Um, but that is something which is ultimately up to you know the user, the plasma chain, mm -hmm. and you know what type of risk models. And if I may, very quick, you already said that the, in your opinion, but the best solution is to put this plasma cache on one server and operate within like one super server. So you have like one operator, right? And in that point. Uh, no, that's what? not necessarily the case. It could be a set of validators. Um, you know, like for example, the most naive construction would be a round robin of validators, for example. So it's holds. like be peer to peer network. Yeah, yeah, it would be done across you know some propagated peer to peer network. You, you just want the entire state to be able to rep be represented on a single machine. On a single machine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The the idea is sort of like on Ethereum. You know, you don't you don't you don't have one single server running Ethereum. Everyone replicates it, but it can be run. Okay. on a single machine currently. With sharding, of course, you know, you, you have a, a more distributed model. Um, oh, um, I, I'd like to just answer his question in a, like I, um, this is like a slightly more technical thing, but I, I think the, the biggest challenge like we haven't quite figured out is, like some people might disagree with me, is like um, proof compression for plasma cache. So like I think the two best candidates are like, um, on the one hand, using RSA accumulators, and on the other hand, like proof compression using, using Using stocks and like I think both have both have their downsides, um, like like the uh, RSA accumulators are not quantum secure. They're not um, um, they have like the, uh, engineering it is I think pretty complicated. And whereas for um, uh, for as stock compression um, um, like SHA tree doesn't compress doesn't run very well in in a stock and like um, the stock friendly hash functions are very expensive on on chain. Um, that's my that's my personal view, but like I think if that is I think if that is solved, like we get like the list of features is is pretty nice. Yeah, just to a little bit emphasize what Joseph said, uh, I you can have any set of validators for a new plasma block, but ideally to just to plainly reduce the cost, you want your data to produce a block, and the place where you take all the transactions from users, you want it as central as possible just to reduce the costs. If you have competing producers. You multiply by the number of producers, the amount of fees you would want to expect from the block, otherwise it's not profitable for them to run the hardware. 
Uh, so it's again a trade-off, but there are there are ways to well, not ways to solve it. You understand every strategy, and most likely you just need to state a set of validators and build a signature. <laughs> yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What about uh, censorship resistance? Like, if you have one operator, then yeah, it's, not, it's a not a feature. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> My mental model is that, uh, and it also relates with fees in Plasma, I believe that you should consider that your transaction is by default censored, and you should feel nice when it gets included. <laughs> and uh, this, is a, this is what allows you to, like, any kind of transaction fees, they don't have to be in the protocol. Because I can literally go to Zanzi, I can tell him, you're my operator, by default he's censoring me. Uh, that is the default, and like, yeah. if, if he, yeah. he checks, have I, have, has he paid me my five PayPal dollars this month? Yes, I, l I let the transaction go through. Yeah. And, 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 and this I is totally like good for like the fee model because it's totally independent. It's like you have a whatever service that you're providing because you're the operator, you, know, you must be operating something, you have some for profit. And yeah, I believe that's the valid, that, that's the proper way to think of it. And if you want stronger guarantees, change your root chain smart contract to be able to process it on the root chain as well to be reflected in the plasma. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think we're running low on time. Um, no, no, I, I, don't, I, don't, don't do question. it. Oh, okay. Sorry. okay um, just, uh, this is just purely for redundancy purposes too. I think like you all made a lot of good points and like all of us would love to go do more research on some of the points that you made, but we never got through introductions, so we only got half of your names to do for the research. So can we just go back and get everybody's names so that we can go research some of the points that you all made on our own? Did some of you not on the walking oh, up do the introduction? We'll just, we'll just do it really quick. Hi, Kelvin Fischer. Joseph Hun. Uh, Shen Zi. David Knott. Georgios Konstantopoulos, it's long. <laughs> River Kiefer. Uh, Alex Vlasov, Alexander for a full name. Johan Barbie. Carl Flourish. And and I think yeah. there's a bunch of you know I don't I don't want to discount all the all the other people working on plasma I think you know you know people like Dan Dan Robinson couldn't make it yes. um, there's a lot of people writing excellent implementation a lot of people you know like people like you know for state walk they're not they they're not represented up here but definitely have been doing a lot of excellent work um, a lot of other 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 people projects and I think you know a lot of people making comments on ETH research and you know this is a very you know the the community is designed to be very inclusive I think you know it's called the plasma you know, implementers group, but it seems to be Plasma's mechanism designers group, and there's a lot of <laughs> other implementations as well. Yeah, and they, they definitely, you know, if you do want to contribute, you know, I think there's an opportunity to be making measurable differences and positive differences as well. ETH research and learnplasma.org. But if, if I may say one thing, like lately I noticed that in ETH research, some posts, like you open a new thread just to ask a question, don't do that. Just post a reply on the existing threads because it's impossible to follow the discussion. <laughs> There's that, and secondly, I believe that the actual contributions to this, like not to sound hostile or anything, it must be technical. Like try to search what has been answered already because like there are a few good resources and if there are not like, we're compiling some which are pretty like uh, all in one, but generally like in the classic forum mentality, like don't ask the same things. M maybe add issues to learn Plasma. I, 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 I sounded like really hostile, but like it is what it is. Yeah. And I, th I think, you know, the, 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 this is an open community as well, but definitely keep it as technical as possible. Um, I, I would agree with that. Uh, but, you know, this is a, you know, inclusive community. Definitely, you know, look at ETH research. Um, we're going through the scientific process of learning how to, you know, do all this stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Woo!